My name is Isabel Dabrowski, and I was hired by Gerhard Herzberg in late 1969, um, fresh out of university with a BSc in chemistry. Um, I knew nothing about spectroscopy. I was hired to help him take measurements of his plates and do drawings for him, essentially that sort of thing, some calculations. And uh, I worked for him for almost 30 years, which, which time I learned an awful lot about spectroscopy and other things too. The work evolved that I did with Hertzberg evolved quite a bit with my knowledge of things. When I started, I knew absolutely nothing, but he was a wonderful teacher. And as I became interested in what he was doing, I did more and more of the actual analysis and sometimes the structuring of the lab experiments. It was an evolution. Um, as I said, he was a great teacher. His opinion was that if you hired somebody to do a job, where at whatever level they were at, you should let them do things, try things out. So he knew when he hired a postdoc, he knew that he was hiring somebody with, who was very good. And his idea was you bring them into the lab, you listen to their ideas. If their ideas are off the wall, then he would tell them. He, he was pretty blunt about that too. But most of the time he was very encouraging. He said, okay, you, this is an experiment you'd like to do, let's try it. And then he would, if they needed help, he was always there to, his door was always open to people to come and ask him questions and feed off him. He enjoyed this. I'm John Stone. I did my PhD at the University of Reading in England in molecular spectroscopy, mostly in the infrared region. Uh, I came to Canada in 1969 as a postdoctoral research fellow with the National Research Council, working in the laboratory of Dr. Gerhard Hertzberg. Um, well, just something that sticks in my memory very vividly is Dr. Hertzberg coming into my room at, uh, NRC in Sussex Drive, room 1057, um, in his white lab coat, which he always wore around the, the office. And uh, we were talking about some new results that I got on the spectrum of uh, deuterium uh, cyanide, DCN, which I had taken on one of his big spectrographs that were in the basement that they had built, and they're very high resolution, very accurate. And it's, and uh, we were looking at the spectrum and seeing some things which were quite unusual. And, and, uh, and we had a really good long talk about the, what, what it might, might mean and how to interpret it. And um, I mean, he did that to lots of, of postdoctoral fellows and, uh, and, and colleagues and things like this. So I wasn't unusual in that, but it was just, uh, it was such a personal inter discussion that we had about science. And, you know, those little things they, they do a lot to, to stimulate you. I'm Bob McKellar. I'm a retired scientist, a spectroscopist, molecular spectroscopist. I worked for many years in the group of Gerhard Hertzberg, the spectroscopy group in the, the National Research Council in Ottawa. And uh, even though I never worked directly on Hertzberg's projects, I knew him very well, of course, because he was our uh, spiritual leader, as it were, even after he retired formally. And uh, so he was a, a mentor and inspiration to all of us in the group. I was, uh, when I first arrived at NRC, I was a postdoctoral fellow. And the, being a, a postdoc in, that, in the famous spectroscopy group was a, a great experience because the group attracted people from all around the world uh, and often the really, really top-notch young scientists. My name is Walter Davidson. I was brought up in Edinburgh, Scotland and studied at the University of Edinburgh in my f chosen field of physics. At the, while I was at the NRC, I was heavily involved in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. There was a very nice nurturing environment in Dr. Hertzberg's laboratory and surroundings. And I think that was an important, perhaps not well acknowledged component of, um, in support of 
his ultimately getting the Nobel Prize for chemistry. Um, Hertzberg was always, well, he wasn't always a prof professional. When you first got to know him, it was on a professional level. But as you got to know him, you know, the personality was always there. And he would, he was very good about reminiscing about certain things, especially towards the end of his life. Dr. Hertzberg was a very methodical man, um, was an excellent investigator, an excellent researcher. His inquisitiveness and so on was really unequaled. He was extremely thorough, but he also had a human side to him. Um, he was interested in, in his co-workers. He would talk to them about, you know, their families and and so on and so on. So he always had a very human person. He was also very good musician, very good, it's either a bass or a baritone, I'm not sure, singer. Um, and he got a lot of enjoyment out of that. So and so He was a, a complete person in many ways. I've got a lot of memories of him as a scientist because of the work that I did with him. But the one thing that I, I've, which is really rather personal that not many other people share, is I discovered he had a wonderful bass baritone voice. His voice was a natural uh, baritone or even bass baritone, and in fact he, he was an amateur singer. I even took to taking music lessons, and one or two evenings he invited me to join him singing. So Dr. Hertzberg and I, Gerhard Hertzberg and I, we used to sing uh, excerpts from operas. I remember very vividly uh, singing the last part of Don Giovanni. His laugh was, uh, was something you would really remember from about him because, because of its tone and sincerity in a way. It, you would, you know, an honest, deep-throated laugh. There were several very special things about Gerhard Herzberg as a scientist and as an administrator. And when he joined the NRC, he basically had a free range to hire whoever he wanted to, and he hired the best. And he gave the scientists that he hired a free reign to follow their own interests, as he did too. That's the way to do science. It's not to constrain it, um, but to follow your notes, to follow your interests, to follow your, your, your questions. Science is a matter of answering, posing and answering questions. And, and, and that, that's a great way of teaching people science, not, not, not in the very detailed thing, it's, you know, the length of this bond is such and such a number of angstroms or whatever. That's not what at all we're talking about. As a teacher of, 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 of research, doing research, doing science. He, he, was, he was a great example. Essentially, in 1971, when he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, the NRC, and through the NRC Canada, had become the mecca for molecular spectroscopy. The, the spectroscopy group at that time NRC was sort of world famous for spectroscopy and um, Hertzberg had built it up over the previous uh, 10 or 15 years and um, I think that's a lot of the reason he won the Nobel Prize was because he had built this amazing group not just himself but a lot of other star scientists. It's a very interesting story about the announcement of the Nobel Prize. Um, he was actually in the Soviet Union at the time, and we didn't know where he was because at the time when they invited him, he knew when he was arriving and when he was leaving, but he had no itinerary. Uh, since he was gone for a couple of weeks, his secretary had decided to move house so she wasn't in, and I was the only one around. So at one point, towards the end of the day, I got this phone call, and it was somebody who identified himself as a journalist from Sweden. 
And he said, could I speak to Dr. Hertzberg? And I explained he wasn't around and we didn't know where he was. And he said, I've just heard that they're going to announce that he won the Nobel Prize. And I want to be the first one to interview him. And I thought, the guy's nuts. I had been working for him. He was a nice man. He, was, he wasn't my idea of a Nobel laureate at all. So I sort of brushed the man off. And I went and talked to Alec Douglas, who was the section head. And I told him the story and he was beaming. This is wonderful news. We were expecting this. It's wonderful. And I walked away thinking, nuts. All, then all hell broke loose the next day. And of course, the media had descended on us. It was chaos, absolute chaos. So much fun. So there was a, a big celebration within the group, within NRC, when he arrived back and his office was decorated with uh, sort of banners and posters and balloons even, as I recall. Um, so that was the, the ultimate excitement, the moment of excitement for the people in his uh, group at NRC was it the return of Hertzberg, the Nobel Prize winner. I remember a discussion with, with Gerhard Hertzberg and some colleagues, um, probably over lunch, at the time he won the Nobel Prize, and he said, there are two reasons for winning a Nobel Prize. As one of them is stamina, that you've spent a long time, a number of years, working on a particular issue and contributing to the literature. The other one is because you have made a breakthrough discovery. And I got mine for, for stamina. It was a very modest way of talking. After he won the prize, Hertzberg was, of course, very busy, even busier than he already was before because everybody wanted him to come and speak and they wanted to give him more awards. His problem was he was too nice. He couldn't refuse an interview. Um, anybody who wanted any information from him, he was willing to, he was always had an open door to anybody and this didn't really stop when he had, had the prize. It had to eventually calm down. He had to be a little more judicious about who he let into his office, but um, uh, Hertzberg wanted to work more after he got the prize. He wanted to feel he. I think he wanted to feel that he deserved it. So he was, and in many ways, he was more free to, to pursue what he wanted to do. At this point, he was um, he was not retired officially, but he was over sixty five, and he was a distinguished research scientist was his title. So he didn't have any administrative things to do anymore. He had been director for a long time and it, this took a long, lot of effort. So he was freer to pursue his interests. And he, he went on, I mean, he was, I think the last paper published was when he was 90. He worked till the very end. He called himself a beaver. Um, he was always a beavering away at his work. He, once he got into something, he had to solve it. So he, you know, a beaver or a bulldog or something like that. He was, once he got an idea, he didn't let it go until it was done. And he expected that of people who worked for him. So it's not surprising that Hertzberg felt part of this, this international family of, of, of scientists, of other knowledge gatherers. And um, of course, because he was won a Nobel Prize, he was he was uh, not only because he was a Nobel Prize, but he, had, he was very highly regarded and, and, and recognized internationally, and so would take up the cause of science internationally. And if that science was being hindered through abuse of human rights or whatever, um, he would take up that cause. And I mean, the classic one that everybody knows about is his support for Sakharov, uh, who was. A, the father of the Soviet H-bomb. Um, but they had been very badly treated. He and his wife uh, had been badly treated. Hertzberg's advocacy for human rights stemmed, it was not just for scientists, it was for everyone. He and his family had suffered terribly during the war and so had so many of his colleagues that he couldn't stand by and if there was something he could do to advance human rights or to help people, out who were having problems like this, he was going to be there. 
and Sakharov was a friend of his. I, this was a terrible thing for him. And so Hertzberg took up at that cause and being somebody who was known uh, as an important figure, um, went out and demonstrated, and demonstrated in front of the Soviet embassy, as it was then, uh, down on Laurier Street. Hertzberg's optimism was um, innate, I think, and uh, he, his optimism meant that he would sometimes latch on to ideas that he, interesting ideas that didn't pan out, that didn't work out. So he, he, um, he was a great man, but he, he made mistakes just like everybody else. The, the great thing about optimism is that often it is justified and things do work and you have to be very persistent to follow them through and Hertzberg had that optimism and the persistence to um, really follow an idea to its conclusion and sometimes they didn't work but then sometimes they did work and that's the, uh, that's the great thing about optimism and a positive uh, approach to life. And it's interesting because he had had, a, in some ways, a very difficult life, having to leave Germany in the 1930s and come to Canada, to Saskatchewan, which, uh, you know, in some ways was a, scientifically a, a letdown, even though personally it worked out very, very well in Saskatoon for him. Uh, so in spite of the, the difficulties he'd had in his life, he retained this sort of positive attitude. People like Gerhard Hertzberg um, don't come every day. Um, we're very fortunate actually in having quite a few Nobel Prizes in Canada. And that means we've got a lot to be proud of. Um, and we've got examples for young people to follow in becoming scientists. Uh, and I think it's, it's really powerful to, to explore some of these stories and to, to show people that, uh, what, what they can do. Um, if, like Hertzberg, you work bloody hard, <laughs> you, don't say, you don't take holidays except on your birthday. I think that uh, Dr. Hertzberg is an important figure in Canadian history by what he achieved um, as a scientist. He drew international recognition to Canada for what he has done, which hadn't happened before. It's difficult to say what Hertzberg's greatest contributions were because they're many faceted in a sense. Um, his books were provided the real foundation for molecular spectroscopy. And uh, even though they were basically written a long time ago, they're still very much in use. And it's quite amazing if you look something up to find that Hertzberg had already thought about this and it, it'll be in there in some form, uh, even though so many years have passed since he wrote it. But also Hertzberg's um, formation of the spectroscopy group at NRC, I think, has to be one of his greatest achievements. But of course, the third aspect of Hertzberg's achievements is his own research. And um, that research really uh, focused, in, in his most productive years, focused on the spectroscopy of unstable molecules like free radicals and molecular ions which are difficult to study because they only have short lifetimes. Challenging to study because you don't quite know what to expect when you see them. Uh, and Hertzberg's persistence and optimism sort of drove him through to find the answers to these challenging uh, questions of short-lived molecules. And so that would be the, the third pillar of his lifetime achievements. I think we should remember him for his gutsiness, his perseverance. I mean, he had to overcome so many obstacles in his life, from being 
You know, his mother was a single mother. His father had died. There was no money for his education. He managed it all. Then during the war, where, or before the war, obviously, when he had to flee the country, he came here with nothing and he made his life here. I think we should remember that that's sheer perseverance will get you a long way.